afternoon. Um, often when we start a master plan, it starts with a trip down to the model shop where um, we find these, these, these boxes um, full, of, um, full of little plastic chips. And it's a, it's a little bit of Lego for, for urban designers. Um, each of those uses represents a different, each of the colors represents a different land use um, in our, uh, in, in the sort of standardized color coding. And, um, and we, we count down the chips depending on how big the master plan is or how big the brief is for the master plan. And then can go and play and, and, and try and test different, different layouts and different ideas. And, um, and as we do that, sort of different, different things start to happen. Um, it's, it's, it, it's very easy to, um, to work um, collaboratively. Um, so even though we're, we're sort of usually known for a, for a sort of high-tech um, workflow, we actually, we actually quite like this sort of low-tech um, workflow because it means that different people can work together much more, uh, much more easily and much more intuitively. And it also means that working with clients um, becomes, becomes a sort of a completely different, um, completely different game. Um, we start to put down ideas with these, with these chips, with these colors, um, but also there's, there's, there's things that, that are not uh, directly apparent um, when we do that. Um, such as issues around microclimate, for instance, will need to, more detailed um, considerations, or questions around mobility. Because at the end of the day, it's the, relations be, the relationship between the different colors on that map that will determine how people will need to move and travel through cities. This was a, an example from a, um, for a Chinese client for a municipality, and we, we tried to effectively figure out how we could use the space in a much more efficient way, and trying to relate the land use much better to the existing um, infrastructure network. We talked already about um, streets a lot and, and, and the, the limit of, of, of space. And I think this is an extract of, um, of, of Soho in London. And um, even though I get frustrated at times sitting on the 19 bus trying to get home along Shaftesbury Avenue, I think it's, still a, it's quite a blessing that we have in, in European cities um, with these historic cores where space is limited um, because it forces us to think very carefully on how we, we allocate the spaces to different users in the, um, on, the, on the streets. This is um, Hermann Knopflacher, a German, a Austrian, sorry, transport professor, um, who demonstrates with this very easy contraption um, some of the problems we still have in cities and that we haven't quite, quite resolved. The, the part, the, the car, and, and the amount of space it, it, it requires, um, both at the, at, at the place where it's parked overnight and the, the, the place where it's parked um, during the day, is causing, is causing serious troubles and challenges still in our, um, in our cities. But luckily, even from the land of the car, um, there's some interesting uh, solutions to some of those problems where activists started to reclaim some of those parking spaces and turn them back into spaces that can be used by the pedestrians. Despite all the, that good news, I think we need to keep in mind that um, this problem is not quite solved yet. On the left-hand side of the slide, you'll find um, the average car ownerships in um, Berlin, London, and New York. And as you can see, those are quite a bit lower than the national averages in those countries. On the right-hand side of the slide, we see the number of car ownerships in Mexico City, Shanghai, and Johannesburg, where the car ownership in the city is far higher than what we have in the, in the national average. In those cities, the car still is a, a status symbol, and cities are still places of affluence where those who can own a car um, will own a car. I think we are in a lucky position because we, we, we could own a car, but we can choose not to because we have alternative ways of how we can travel around. Another problem we got with the, with, with the car becomes apparent when we look at this slide. On the, uh, on the, on the left-hand side, you see that if I'm standing still, I'm consuming about half a square meter of space around me. If I walk, that space increases. If I sit on a bus, that's about 40% occupied. I'm probably using about eight square meters of city space. If I'm sitting in a car and travel at 30 or 50 kilometers an hour, that space requirement suddenly explodes. And this starts to cause serious problems in our cities and around our cities. And still, if you want to live in the world that's on the left, we will get always these, um, these enormous um, traffic, um, traffic contraptions that we see on the right. The other important aspect um, that I would come back to quickly is, is, is land uses and how they relate to movement. These are um, maps from a, from a service called WalkScore, Walk and they describe um, in green the areas where, um, that are supposedly easier to get around and that are more walkable. And they are generated by an algorithm which effectively works out um, that uh, the, the number of shops, pharmacies, schools, cinemas, um, in the catchment area from, from a given location on those, um, on those plans, on the left, Seattle, and on the right, um, New York City. 
and it's this important relationship between these, between these amenities and, and, and their accessibility that has a profound impact, I believe, on the quality of life and when we, for, for all of us who live in, in, in cities, and I think it's also the quality why we, why we want to live in cities. Um, we can make this point even, even more, more, more stark. The, the image on the left you might recognize is, um, is Venice, or the street grids of Venice with the, a little bit of the Canal de Grande running through. Um, on the right-hand side, it's Phoenix. Um, it's 400 meters from one intersection to the other. That's a five-minute walk to get from one corner to the next corner where I could possibly um, change direction. Um, it's not a surprise that nobody would want to walk in these environments. Also, it's probably fair to say that there's going to be more restaurants and cafes and other people on the, on the left-hand side of the image than we'll find in the suburbs of, of, of Phoenix. Um, and, and often, I think, when we, when we want to walk, it's the excitement of the, of the urban environment that we enjoy and, 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 and running into, into other people and seeing other people. So it's really important to think about how we, um, how we organize the, um, these structures. And I think the challenge we've got still today is how we're going to retrofit these kind of environments. Um, another city that's, that's well known for its street grid, for its rectilinear street grid, is, is, street grid, is New York City. Um, here the blocks are a little bit shorter, they're about 200 meters um, wide, and this is a representation of the residential density in New York City. And when we had a, showed this image to the client from this Chinese project that I showed you at the very beginning, um, there was a sort of a moment of surprise where they realized that actually these places to the left and to the right of Central Park are quite desirable locations and people paying a lot of money to get, a, get, get an apartment in these, in these areas. And really that high density in the right, in the right circumstances can work. The, the hole that you saw previously on the map is filled by this and this is the employment. And what surprised all of us is, is, the, is the enormous concentration of employment uses in, um, in, in all our cities. And we saw a slide at the beginning from London that showed the, the, these peaks in the, in, in, in the centre of London, and we find an even more extreme picture in, um, in New York. Um, out of the 3.4 million jobs that are in New York, two, of, 2 million of those are in Manhattan, and about 65% of those are in the two black dots, which, are, which is Midtown and Downtown, the areas where the financial, financial services cluster. The, the areas shown in red here then are the, are the places where there's more jobs rather than residents. And you see, apart from um, sort of the airport site and, and, some, and some industrial areas um, in, the, in, in the outer boroughs, it is, the, um, it, it is these, these focal points in, in Manhattan that really attract these enormous um, amounts, of, um, amounts of people. And, and naturally, a transport system had to be developed um, that serves these, um, these levels of, um, of, of traffic demand, where one and a half million people needs to go in and out um, every day just to, just to travel. And it's, it's logical that these people could not do that all by, by private cars. Um, and this is how New York arrived at the impressive numbers of 70% of jobs that um, are served within a 400 meter um, radius from a subway station. So that's a five minute walk. Um, or a, almost 40, more than 40% of the people who live within a five-minute walk of these, um, of these subway stations. Now, as master planners, we don't always have the chance to build a whole city, and a lot of the issues that I talked about um, really require a, bit, a lot of scale. So while we're not planning um, subway schemes on a, on, on a daily basis, we get to look at um, a transport infrastructure on a slightly smaller scale. And um, one, of the, one of the examples we, we heard about already today is the tube station in, um, in Canary Wharf, which um, together with the uh, DLR, which arrived a few years earlier, really makes this proposition of, of Canary, Wharf, uh, Canary Wharf workable, um, as previous developers um, struggled to, get, um, to, to let their floor spaces, um, as the companies could have no way of getting their staff to, the, um, to their workplaces. In 2018, we also heard about Crossrail. Crossrail will arrive, arrive in, um, in Canary Wharf, and, um, and, and we've had the chance then to design a, a, a station on, on, top of the, uh, on top of that Crossrail infrastructure. And in this case, we had a bit more space, and we, we devised a sort of a garden structure that's on a, on a sort of semi-open roof, um, a timber construction, um, to really celebrate this notion of public space. And, 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 and to give sort of space back to, to in, in a place where um, there's a lot of steel on, on glass already. Um, and this is a shot from a, a couple of weeks ago. There's, as I said, a timber, a timber roof with um, ETFE pillows um, that help to um, keep the rain out that we um, ever so often are faced with in London. 
Um, a few years prior to um, Canary Wharf, we were doing a metro system in Bilbao. And in, in this case, the, the focus really was trying to make um, an environment that was um, suitable and, um, and, and, and comfortable for the passengers to be in. Because in reality, a, a, a metro system can be something quite disorientating as you descend into, into, into a tunnel and into the darkness. And a lot of the architecture tried to bring in um, both very legible stations, but also bring in daylight wherever possible. Because I think both at the, at the center of our master plans, but also at the center of our buildings, we try and design for the, for, for the users um, of, those, um, of those spaces. One of the spaces in London that um, until, well, probably now 20 years ago, um, was frequented more by, by pigeons rather than by people was, um, was um, Trafalgar Square. And, um, and those of you who haven't been in London um, that long won't remember, but effectively the, the, the square was a massive roundabout um, as, the, as the traffic went all the, all the way around, including the northern side in front of the, um, the National Gallery. And probably one of the most difficult um, projects in, 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 terms of, in terms of sort of urban invention, but also one of the most modest ones. Um, I think this is a particularly good example um, where we managed to transform a, um, a, a space that was dominated by cars into an environment that suddenly linked Trafalgar Square back to the National Gallery and created an open space and a civic space um, that today is used by, um, by a lot of Londoners for all kinds of, um, for all kinds of interventions. And um, somebody in the office was telling me this story the other day that um, because closing a road is probably one of the most difficult things um, to do, particularly in that central part of London, um, we actually set up a, a mock um, construction site outside the National Gallery to see whether London would come to a, to a, um, a standstill, but luckily it didn't, and, uh, and the transformation went ahead. But it's not just London that's, that's, that's struggling with these, um, these leftovers of, 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 of sort of excessive um, transport or car-based infrastructure. This is a picture from Slusen in Stockholm, um, where the only bits of open spaces, again, were sort of marginally or, 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 or closed off um, pieces of land between major arteries and, um, and, 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 and wide roads. Um, the proposal here was, um, looking from the other side, to effectively tidy up the, the, the overall, um, the overall um, route network of, of, of cars. And being an outsider in this point was quite helpful because it allowed us to come in and ask the sort of stupid questions that the local person maybe not have been able to do. And we managed to get to a, get to a point where we keep the city running with, the, with where the, the car infrastructure is needed, but really give the space back to the people and integrate an interchange um, that's underneath the, um, the plaza and that, um, and that green landscaped area on your, um, on your left with a rail-based transport system. And this is a view then looking back towards, the, um, back towards that, that side. There's, a, there's some commercial activities integrated that as, as, as well. But the, the notion of an interchange, I think, is an important one. And looking, um, looking back into our archives, this was an image that I, I, I dug out from a um, project we did for Hammersmith. And um, as, you, as you probably know, we haven't, we haven't built it. Um, but it's, um, it, 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 I think it's, it, it's, it's a good reminder that sometimes we need to keep pushing ourselves as architects and designers. And unless we try new things out, even if we then, they don't go ahead, um, we'll keep stuck um, doing the same things over and over again. And one man who um, pushed, pushed thinking and, and, and ideas was, um, was Buckminster Fuller. Um, you'll recognize the car on your right, the um, Ford Model T. Um, some of you might know the car on the, on the left. It's a Dimax, Dimaxian Model 3 um, that was devised by, by Buckminster Fuller, who just was not satisfied with the way that the cars were, were, were devised as, 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 as a vehicle and completely reinvented the, 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 the automobile, um, putting the wheel in the back, um, creating a much larger cabin for more passengers and also creating a much more streamlined um, body of the, of, of, of the car to, um, to, to have something that uses less, um, less energy as it travels around cities. Um, as we were doing the research on that, uh, on, on that Damaxian, we, we, we came across the sketch on the, on, on the left, which is called the Damaxian um, 4.5. And interestingly, it, it is, there's never been a, 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 physical, um, a physical prototype built um, of that Damaxian. But we thought it would be interesting um, as we as think about cities in, uh, mobility in cities, to take that sketch and take these ideas and turn it into a 21st century um, prototype. The, the car has um, three wheels again. They're all individually, individually powered. It means there's a very tight um, turning circle. 
Um, and there's all kinds of things that with the technology that we've seen, again, in, in the very first talk, now become, become possible. Um, the image on the left, um, you'll, you'll see the spacing bet between the, the traditional vehicles, which is much wider. And if we had um, a, a, a fleet of more intelligent vehicles, we can actually, where this private mobility is required, um, get these, these vehicles to talk to each other and, um, and, 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 and drive much more closely and use this space much more efficiently. If you remember that space with the, these 160 square meters that a car traditionally uses when it travels through a city. Now, this is a short vision of what that, um, of what that might, um, might look like. <laughs>